Good morning. Good morning. Good, morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Good to be anywhere He is. Amen. That's Amen. right. And we get to sing His praises. I want you to go to number 118, looks like. Yeah. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. The great shepherd, the rock of all ages, Almighty God is He. Bow down before Him, love and adore Him. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages. Almighty God is He. Bow down before Him, love and adore Him. His name is wonderful. If you believe that, say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. He's in the house today. We're glad to see each and every one of you here this morning. It's a beautiful day that God has given to us for the pure purpose of worship. And I'm glad you're here to do that. If you're visiting with us today and you've never filled out a visitor's card, will you just slip up your hand and hold it there for a second? Uh, Let these men give you a card. Please fill it out and drop it in the offering plate in a moment. And we'll be very, very grateful to you uh, for doing so. Prayer time on Tuesday at 10 o'clock, our Wednesday night, our regular services, with choir practice immediately following. Let's bow our heads together now for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for the privilege of gathering here in the in the house of worship today. And Lord, we do invite you to be a part of this service, Lord. We want you to tread the avenues of every heart to touch every life. And Lord, I pray that when we leave here today, we leave different than we were when we came because we've been touched by the Master. Father, I pray there's one person here today that's lost and undone. That Lord, this is the day that they'll come to know you in a free pardon of sin. And Father, I do pray for those of our fellowship that are sick, those that are facing tests and procedures in the days to come, that, Lord, you might bring healing and blessings to each one. Lord, for those who've lost loved ones in recent days, that, Lord, you're going to be there to comfort and give peace in their hearts. Father, for the men and women who serve in our military today, would you bless them and care for their families as they remain here. Father, I pray for our missionaries today around the world, that you might meet their needs as they try to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray now for all of our musicians and Brother Wayne as he leads us. Lord, would you accept our praises today? Father, we love you, we adore you, and we thank you for every blessing that comes our way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship our Lord. We're marching to Zion. Come we that love the Lord and let our joy be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And tell around the throne and let us around. 
around the throne. Sing it out, church. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching on the way to Zion, the beautiful city of God. It led our songs about and every tear we dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's prayer. We're marching through Gentlemen, may I have your attention? I want to introduce to you in this corner of the good and the right stands a champion robed in white. His height exceeds the heavens. His weight outweighs the world His reach reaches everywhere His age is evermore He is higher than the highest Greater than the great No one will ever take His crown away He's more mighty than the mightiest Of love. He left his hometown to enter this arena to raise his hands in victory for me. In an angry crowd, crucified this king who wore their crown. As they gladly watch this champion going down Oh, but I will never count him out Cause I'm a witness of The day he rose to retain the title Champion of love He is higher than the highest Greater than the great No one will ever have your Bibles this morning, turn to Acts the 13th chapter, beginning with verse number 26. Acts the 13th chapter, and let's begin with verse number uh, 26. We're going to continue looking at Paul's sermon, 
We're going, to, we're going to get into death with it today. For they that dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every Sabbath day, and have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause in him, yet desired, uh, they pilot that he should be put to death. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him up from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee unto Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers... God hath fulfilled the same unto us his children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. As it is also written in the second Psalms, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He said on this wise I will give you the, the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he said unto another Psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after that he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you forgiveness of sin. And by him all that believed are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware therefore lest that come unto you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers and wonders and perish, for I work a work in your day, a work that ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached unto them the next Sabbath. And when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews, uh, religious proselytes, followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were moved, filled with envy, and spake against the, the, those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first be spoken unto you, but see ye put it from you and judge yourself unworthily of everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I will set thee in a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the end of the earth? And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout, devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of, out of their coast. But they took off the dust of the, shook off the dust of their their feet against them and came unto Iconia. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. May we pray together. Our Heavenly Father, if it please you this morning, would you permit us to share this message with our people? Lord, may the Holy Spirit have absolute charge here of everything that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. In our message today, we're going to see how Paul and Barnabas turning from the Jews to the Gentiles with the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a difference between the decision and the implementation. The latter almost takes, uh, uh, always takes longer. Peter got the revelation that the Gentiles get the gospel, but Paul got the assignment uh, to take it to them. And the first example of that major shift uh, in the Pradidian church at Antioch. Now, in a previous message... We began our study in the first and longest recorded sermon of the Apostle Paul. It was delivered in the synagogue and uh, when he and Barnabas were on their first missionary journey. 
as normal after the reading of the Old Testament scriptures, the synagogue leaders invited for comments of those in the audience. And specifically on this occasion from Paul and Barnabas, uh, perhaps because they were visitors. But by way of review, Paul's theme was to show how God had sovereignly guided the nation of Israel through every stage of his existence, beginning back with the enslavement in Egypt. Point, uh, his point was uh, that sending... Uh, that ascending of Jesus Christ into the world by God was consistent with God's uh, provincial oversight and provisions for the nation in the preceding centuries. And he concluded that the history of Israel and the presentation of Jesus Christ uh, with the climax uh, of conclusion. He said in verse 26, Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham and those Gentiles among you who fear God, to you the word of salvation has been sent. Folks, God has sent his salvation to every man, woman, boy, and girl who will listen and accept it. Now, we pick up in Paul's sermon uh, with, uh, with that last statement. Paul further exhorts them to believe Christ who, who, he, who killed him and the evidence of his resurrection and Paul's final uh, exhortation to them about how they should respond to Christ. Now, first of all, Paul begins an application section of his sermon with a call to respond and finish with a warning about the cost of refusing Christ. Now, there's, there's an interesting double meaning in Paul's words in verse 26. This word, the word of, the, of this salvation, refers to Christ as the living word of God and brings salvation to mankind, or does it, uh, or refers to the word, the message. Paul is preaching them probably both. This message of salvation is for now. Folks, we don't have to wait till we get to heaven to get saved. We can get to save and enjoy the blessings of God this very day. Amen. Jesus Christ is here for you and I today. And he'll be here tomorrow, but he's here now that you and I can experience the love of God. Paul wanted the Jews and the Gentile audience in the synagogue to know that they were responsible for what they were hearing about Jesus. And that's always true. The Holy Spirit accompanies the preaching of God's word and applying it to the hearts of the listeners. When we get to the judgment of God, every one of us here today will be held accountable for the Word of God that we hear today. We can't plead ignorant. We can't plead that my neighbor kept me from doing it. Folks, you and I who sit under the gospel of Jesus Christ have to give an account to that. God's going to hold us responsible for what we do with the Word of God. Now, in verse 27 through 29 is a charge of rejection. Next, Paul explains how the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem had rejected Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Uh, verse 27 says their, their ignorant apathy. Paul says something very profound that the prophets of Israel had foretold that the Messiah would be rejected. An example is back in Zechariah, uh, the 12th chapter, and verse 10. Even though the leaders of Israel knew that they, about this, they rejected him Anyway, their actions fulfill the words of the prophet in spite of all the evidence that Jesus provided. He was still rejected by those who were dedicated to living their lives and understanding the Old Testament. In verse number 28, their, their ignorant actions, the actions of those who rejected Jesus were, were doubly uh, uh, ignorant. Not only did they not recognize their own Messiah, but they, oh, when they did reject him, they could find no fault in him. And Paul, Pilate, if you remember, uh, against his better judgment, said, I'm going to wash my hands of him. Uh, you know, I find no harm in this man, no ill will. But he still condemned him to death. And they were responsible for that. And we find also that they were the, uh, ignorant of the, the accommodations in verse 29. The Jewish leaders accommodated the forces of evil that conspired to, to put the Savior uh, of the world to death. They did it uh, so out of arrogance and, and even the burial of Christ was prophesied uh, many centuries earlier at, when people of that day were crucified. Most of the time they were just buried in mass graves. But Jesus was taken down and put in a private uh, sceptre of Joseph of Arimathea. 
and Matthew 27, 57 in, as a fulfillment of Isaiah 53 and 9. And they made his grave with the wicked, but the rich at his death because he had done no violence nor any deceit in his mouth. Now the mystery in what Paul is saying that as God had provincially uh, been overseeing the nation of Israel in the past, so uh, his hand was sovereign and, and in the rejection of his son as it fulfilled in what had been written, having charged the nation. By implication, those Jews to whom he was preaching, preaching had rejected the Messiah. Paul presented the evidence of God's stamp of approval upon Jesus by raising him from the dead. Folks, Jesus' resurrection is what makes it unique. That's what makes it different than any other man, woman, boy, or girl. He's the only one who's ever been resurrected. That's the difference. And this morning, if you're sitting here and you're continually rejecting Jesus Christ, you're no better than the, the scribes and Pharisees in the Scriptures. The Word of God is preached here week in and week out. And when we turn a hard heart to it, folks, God is not pleased with that. We need to turn our lives over to Jesus Christ and let Him mold and make us those vessels that can be used in the hands of a living God. Then verses 33 to 39 is the claim of the resurrection. Now that He's gone to bring His own evidence to bear, this is going to have some similarities in things that we've already talked about previously. But folks, he's going to claim the resurrection as that powerful proof that he is the one, Jesus, who indeed is the Messiah. The evidence of the resurrection, every time the apostles preached in the book of Acts, they were preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Compare the resurrection of the crucifixion and the resurrection always gets a, a greater emphasis. Why? Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, it is what sets the death of Christ apart from everyone else who has died because he's the only one who has ever come back from the dead. The resurrected one. And the evidence of the resurrection is overwhelming as Paul sees those details and he summarizes it in, in, in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul saw himself, uh, saw the Lord himself on the road to Damascus when he was confronted by the Lord. To talk to Paul was to talk to someone who had seen Jesus back from the grave. To the Jews in the synagogue, Paul's uh, representation is a link to the living Christ. That resurrection, of course, was a difficult hurdle for them to overcome. Then there's an explanation for the resurrection. Because what a difficult idea the resurrection was to the Jews. Paul goes into great detail in this sermon about how the Old Testament foretold that God would raise the suffering Messiah from the grave. Paul cited the Old Testament passages, uh, presumably from memory, and weaved them into the argument for the resurrection of God, of Christ. Psalms 2, Paul points out the, and quotes uh, Psalms 2 and verse 7. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Obviously that connection between the resurrection is this. But who but God could come back from the dead? That argument Paul worked two ways. If Jesus was resurrected, he must be the Son of God. If Jesus was the Son of God, then he had the re resurrection to fulfill the Old Testament. In either case, folks, the link between Jesus' deity and the resurrection has the reckoning with any who consider Jesus Christ. He is our Savior today, folks. And he's not in a grave somewhere dead. He's not a piece of stone sitting somewhere. He's not a block of wood somewhere, but he's a living Lord the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we need to worship him in such a way. And then Isaiah 55. Paul next quotes Isaiah 55, 3. He said, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Now Paul quoted uh, this verse in connection with his own words that Christ was no more returned to corruption. Paul's link to the resurrection with the covenant of God made with David that one of his descendants would rule forever on the throne. A dead Messiah still in the grave could never have fulfilled that covenant promise. In order for Jesus to be the Christ, the Messiah, he had to be raised from the dead. 
Psalm 16 points out. Finally, Paul quotes the key verse in the Old Testament of the resurrection. Ye are not allowed your Holy One to see corruption. The first line in that verse in Psalm 16 promises that you will not leave your soul in hell. Paul points according to that uh, psalm that David, the author, could not have been speaking of himself since he was buried with the fathers and saw corruption. And, and, and we see that, that Jesus Christ did not see corruption, nor did God abandon his soul. Instead, he raised him from the dead. Both David and Jesus Christ served their own generations by the will of God, but only one came out of that grave, and that is Jesus Christ. I put over almost 900 people in the ground. Not any of them's come back, folks. Only Jesus, only Jesus will ever be the resurrected one until the day that he comes and calls them from the grave. We, why do we want to serve the devil? I ask that question so many times. I had a lady tell me one time, she said she had gotten burned bad and, and living a life of sin. and She said, oh, preacher, it's so hard. To live a life like you, you're talking about. And I said, honey, we must be talking about the wrong thing. I said, here you are. You've been in this accident. You're burned. You hurt. That's, and, and serving God is hard? I don't think so. It's hard because we make it hard, folks. When we let God saturate our soul and we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, I'm telling you folks, He walks and talks with us every day and life can be a joy to live. Amen. Amen. It's not a drudgery. It's not a fight when God's on our side. Let God do the fighting for us and let's get out of the way and just serve Him wholeheartedly. Amen. Amen. Let God do it. Then what's the effects of the resurrection? The resurrection is not a, just a historical fact. It has effect that it's the whole point, the forgiveness of sin. And folks, without that forgiveness of sin, we'd all be in that puts of hell today. But God saw fit to send His Son for that sacrifice that you and I could have life eternal in Jesus Christ. Then verses 40 through 41, the cost of refusing. Paul lays out the evidence for who Jesus is, the Son of God, and what he's done, providing salvation, uh, forgiveness of sin. But then he concludes his sermon with a warning. The cost of refusing to believe the Son of God. Now Paul again demonstrates his mystery of, of the Old Testament with regard to Christ when he uh, uh, quotes Habakkuk, the first chapter in the fifth verse. As the prophet Habakkuk was upset because God was going to judge Israel by using a nation more wicked than Israel, the Chaldeans. And Paul is warning the Jews that they stand in danger of God's judgment for not believing Christ. Folks, think about America today. And as I thought about this this week, I mean, it made cold chills run down my back. If God judges Israel, and God judges the children of Israel and, and many other nations of the world, why won't he judge America? Where do we get the idea that, that we're going to slip by somewhere? We're not. We're killing more babies than we've ever killed in the history of the world. We've took prayer out of schools. We took the Ten Commandments off the street, the courthouse square. And, 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 and last Sunday made me sick at my stomach with that gay marriage mess in the paper printed for to run into our living rooms now. And folks, we as a church sit by. Let me tell you something, folks. America is doomed to fall and be punished by God. If you don't believe that, you write it down that your preacher told you that. Because I'm telling you, folks, it's going to happen. And God doesn't have to have a big nation to do it either. We need, there's a cost turning our backs on God. There's a cost to pay when we don't accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Then there's a sequel to Paul's sermon. And I think this is wonderful. Paul had been preaching and the Jews weren't listening and after it was the service was over, the Gentiles begged that those words might be preached to them again the next Sabbath. All of our preachers sitting here today, what would you do 
if your families came up to you and said, oh, preach it again, preach it again, brother, we'd probably fall out on the floor. What if your Sunday school teachers, you know, the Word of God is so true and so real, and you, and, and you just told your Sunday school teacher, I've got to hear that again. That's exciting. That's what God's done. I've got to hear it again. Do it again. But that's what the Gentiles were telling Paul. I want to hear it again. We need to hear that message of God's saving grace and what can happen and what he will do. And folks, Paul preached again. What's the res response by the congregation? There were Jews and Gentiles both who followed along with Paul and Barnabas after the meeting of the synagogue and, and, and it was over and, and that was the only sign of, of what was to come. That next Sabbath they were standing uh, only, there's only standing room in the synagogue. And, and we see, folks, this is where the, the Jews got upset. Here, a sparingly crowd came. And Paul and Barnabas get to preaching. And they can't seat them all. They have to stand up. And they were hungry for the Word of God. Folks, today, people in America, we ought to be hungry for the Word. We ought to be hungry for the Word of God. Because it changes life. Those who are sitting here today and you're saved and you know you're going to heaven, you, it's not a hope so or I think so, but you know. Where would you be today if it wasn't for the saving grace of God? Answer that for yourself. Would you be one of those people out in the streets, lost and undone? Would you be wherever without the love of God? Folks, today's the day of salvation. Today's the day that Jesus died for you and wants to live in your life. Now let's look at the refocus by Paul and Barnabas. Paul would later write in Romans, the first chapter, and verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Folks, he affirmed that the Jews who were attacking him, that it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. But since you rejected it, judge yourselves unworthily of everlasting life. Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Are you sitting here today, are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you ashamed that Jesus Christ came and saved your soul? I hope not. We need to tell it to the world, folks, that I'm a born-again believer. I'm a child of the King. Unashamedly. I'll tell you, folks, it'll make a difference sitting in the doctor's office, sitting around the hospital, tell them what God's done for you. It'll make a difference in those hours that you sit there. Folks, Jesus Christ died. Then we see that revival came to that city. Many Gentiles believed the gospel and were saved, and many other in the regions of the word of the Lord was spread. And we could summarize this entire episode with the Apostle John's words. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Whether you're Jew, whether you're Gentile, boarding that ship is the only way, folks, to gain access to our heavenly home. Make sure that you've opened your heart to Jesus Christ. Because, folks, this soul is going to live for eternity. Are you going to live in heaven or are you going to live in hell? That's a choice you have to make. But you're going to live somewhere forever. Do not reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Every Christian praying. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus, come down here and let me help you. Let me pray with you, please. I won't embarrass you. I just want to show you Jesus. And if whatever needs is in your heart and life today, just kneel here at these altars and on these front rows. Let God do it. Let God take care of you. He promises to do just that. Don't leave this place unprepared to meet God. But you know, you know, you know that you're ready. Would you trust Jesus today? Heavenly Father, would you take this invitation now? Use it, Lord, to your honor and your glory. Lord, may not one person leave this place today, Lord, unprepared to meet you. But Lord, when we walk out that door today, 
that we know, we know, we know we can go to heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May we stand together, please. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that